So this will be another uh, little tour into some things with procedures and uh, I'm going to introduce a couple of new ideas in this one also. So let's just start by taking a look at the code. Notice that we do have three sheets in this workbook, sheet one, two, and three. That's something that will come up later. So uh, I'm just going to start out by looking at my main. And again, uh, you're getting tired of hearing it, but main is just an arbitrary name, but it's a good one for the main driver in your code. So declared a number of variables for last row, column, and start row. Initialize those variables to uh, column one, start row one. And I used the find last row function that I copied off of our Blackboard website to find the last row. Um, I can just scan down real quickly and we take a look at that again. This is something now that you can start getting a little bit of a better sense of. This is a function. It's very similar to a sub procedure. Um, other than the fact that we don't use sub, we use the word function. We have the name and then notice again the parameter list. Now this is something that we've been talking about. So in this particular case the parameter list includes only one variable and we're passing in the column. And a difference between a subprocedure and a function is that the function returns a value. And so we have to specify if we want, and it's a good idea, we have to specify the return type of that function. And so finally, in this function, to return a value, you assign whatever value you want that function to return, you assign it to the name of the function. Um, and that's a, that's a little bit odd, but it, it, you know it's pretty easy to understand. So there's the name of the function, and notice my last line here assigns a value to that function name. And so then I can use that function value, the returned value, I can use that here to assign to last row. So uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, set up a range variable, initialize that range variable to start row column and last row column. And then I'm calling my copy positive, um, and that will copy the positive numbers from the range. And it indicates where it's going to copy them to. Notice it says it's copying them to sheet 2. And indeed, you'll notice here that sheet 2 is a string variable. See the quotes there. So this is a, a procedure with two arguments. Um, the ar first argument, of course, is the range that I'm going to uh, have it scan through. And the second argument is the sheet where I wanted to copy the positive numbers to. So let's take a look at that procedure. <clears throat> so here's copy positive. And again, because we had two arguments in the call to copy positive, two arguments, the first being the range and the second being the string, we better have two arguments in our parameter list. And so if we study this parameter list carefully, it's, it's pretty easy to see that the very first argument, this variable, a range variable, lines up nicely with the range variable in our call to the subprocedure. Again, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. The first argument matches the first parameter in your parameter list of your procedure. The second argument we notice here is a string variable. So the second argument here better be a string variable, and indeed you'll notice that it is a string variable. And the name of that variable is sheet name. Anytime we declare a variable in a parameter list for a procedure or a function, these variables act identically to a variable that was declared with a dim statement. The only real difference is that we don't have to initialize these variables in the parameter list because they get initialized when the person calls the procedure the value gets passed in and that parameter is initialized and so it gets its value from outside the procedure. Again, this is kind of a communication channel, if you will, so we can send information to the procedure. So we have a range variable and we have a string variable for the sheet name. Let's take a look at the rest of this procedure. So I declare another range variable just called cell. And if we jump ahead just a minute, you'll notice that I'm using that in my for each loop here. 
because your for each loop still has to have a control variable and in this case it's cell that's the variable that gets changed every time this loop comes around to the next statement just like with the for i equals 1 to 10 well i gets changed every time it goes around the loop it goes 1 2 3 and so on to 10 well this cell variable is going to get changed every time it goes around the loop also and it's getting its value from whatever range we're executing over so it's going to be a assign the value of each cell in turn as this loop executes. So we declare our cell variable. Then we have an output row. We need to keep track of what row we're on when we output the values to the new sheet. And we also want to keep track of what column we want to put them in. Well, I'm hard coding the output row and column right here in our sub procedure. But you could imagine adding two additional parameters to this sub procedure to specify the starting output row and the output column for placing the values. That would be a four parameter sub procedure, but no big deal. So let's take a look at what this does. It basically says for each cell in the range, we simply want to check to see if that cell is greater than zero. Again, we're doing greater than zero because we called this sub procedure copy positive. So we're going to copy the positive numbers. So if the cell is greater than zero, then what do we want to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say worksheets. Now this is new, and we're specifying a worksheets collection. In Microsoft Excel, every workbook has a worksheets collection. There are several ways you can refer to that, to individual worksheets in that worksheets collection. The way I chose to do it in this case was to use the name of the worksheet as seen on the sheet tab. So if I put the name of the worksheet right in there, and I'm doing that by passing in the string. So this call right here says sheet 2. It gets passed into this variable, this parameter in my in my procedure, it gets passed in there, so the sheet 2 is stored in there. And then when I say worksheets sheet name, it refers to sheet 2 in this case. So I'm saying go to worksheets, worksheets with that name, so it goes to that worksheet. And then I say dot cells, so now I'm specifying where on that worksheet I want to place this value. So I say I want to go to the output row, and the output row at the beginning, of course, has been initialized to 1. So the very first time it's going to go to worksheets sheet 2, output row 1, output column 1, and it's going to store the value that's in the current cell we're on onto that new worksheet. So we store a value. Well, once we store a value, we have to be thinking ahead here because we're going to have another value probably coming around as we look at all the numbers. And when we find that next positive number, we don't want to put it in the same place because that would overwrite the last number we put out on that sheet. So we need to increment our output row to the next row down so that we're actually placing the numbers in turn in each row on our worksheet. Now, one thing you could try doing if you wanted to is comment out this statement. If you comment out this statement, you can then watch it run, and you'll see that the very last number that you place out on that output sheet is going to be right in the very first cell, and you will only have one number copied over to that output sheet. So here's the end if, and then next cell goes around, grabs the next cell, and continues this process. So this is a pretty straightforward idea. Um, you definitely need to type this code in and give this a shot. And again, pay attention to my indenting here, because this is a style of indenting you want to use here. Notice that my for loop is indented one stop. Everything inside the body of that for loop is indented one tab stop. Everything inside the body of the if statement is indented an additional tab stop. So I've got a little stub right here for copy negative. Now copy negative is, as you can imagine, going to look very similar to copy positive. So all you need to do is pretty much copy that code that was above there and, and uh, make the little slight change that's necessary. But this will make the code a little bit more real to you when you do it. Another idea that if you wanted to is you could actually add two more parameters to the parameter list on both of these methods, these 
procedures and you could pass in what the output row the starting output row is and the output column that you want them to be placed in and uh, see if you could get that to work that would be a nice little uh, change to this it would be fairly easy to do so uh, give that a shot and uh, see how that goes